Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three very different countries across Europe. I'm your host, Ven, and I'm joined here today by Alessio. From one different country, hello. And Cara. From another different country, hello. Yep, yeah, and myself, which I already said, so uh, I'm coming from a different island um, and country. Uh, and we're here to talk today about EOS Island of Angels, Pathfinder the Adventure Card Game, Rise of the Rune Lord, and the far more shortly titled Sail. Uh, but we'll start first of all with the standee catch-up. How have things been with you, Kara? Uh, well, things have been a mixed bag. <laughs> um like uh yeah just you know back in school and it's uh i wish i wasn't back in school Be- being teacher is beautiful you always yes. get back to school <laughs> it's ah uh... anyway so um but uh as my therapist said hey maybe your goal should be just to survive the days and <laughs> so that's what i'm going with now um, <clears throat> apart from that, I um, actually got to play a, a couple of things recently, um, including the game I'm talking about today, EOS, uh, uh, Forest of Pangaea, Earth Rising, and I played some more Star Wars Armada because I pressured someone I know into you know playing uh, playing a game of Armada with me and. He reluctantly agreed, so yeah, okay, here's all this stuff. So maybe, you know, for once he can he can play it. And I got him hooked again. And now he's always like, hey, want to play Armada? <laughs> That's pretty cool. And um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's that. And um, oh, also, um, side note, there is um, a Armada legacy project. So because uh, Atomic Mass Games kind of seems to have forgotten they also own Armada now and they don't do anything with it. Um, some fans have decided to take matters into their own hands and um, develop new stuff, make balance uh, changes and so, and it looks pretty interesting. Um, so that's nice. Um, we'll look more into it at uh, an appropriate time. Yeah, um, also my dog um, graduated puppy class. So um, <laughs> on on Wednesday, we will uh, go to the pubescent dog class. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to that. Um, and even though I always in, in, in the dog school have the feeling that... It, short explanation. My dog is a great dog. Yuko is is amazing. She listens well and she's so well behaved. Everyone is always uh, commenting on how how nice she is and how well trained she is and whatever. But when I go to dog school, she seems to forget everything and um, doesn't listen and always wants to go where I don't want her to go. And so I'm always kind of embarrassed <laughs> because I think, oh my God, those people must believe that I never train with my dog. And um, But on Saturday, the trainer who agreed that Yuko can go to the next class actually said that, oh yeah, she's like, she listens so well and whatnot. And I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the behavior she shows in dog school, you consider good. I'm fine with that. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things where a trainer, if they spend time with a lot of different dogs, so they can easily look at a dog and see their progress and be like, actually, this is quite good for where they are. And whereas you as a dog owner, you're constantly like, why Why do they behave one way with us and what, a different way when there are other dogs around? Uh, so, yeah, it's hard to judge how your dog's progressing on its own, but it is good that you're going to those kind of schools. We, as, as I think people who listen know, Pam is a rescue from the island of Aruba um, and she was abandoned uh, because she had puppies. She was dumped on a beach and chained up and her puppies were separated from her and dumped in a cave. Um, for people who are worried, everything, everyone was rescued safely. Four male puppies, one female puppy. They all live in America. But she, she has terrible... Um, capability of dealing with other dogs she can't um, except for like three dogs who she's really good friends with um, 
there's Akka, who's a, a small lap dog just up the lane, um, although she's not getting on well with him because, since he's gotten a new um, mate, new friend. Um, uh, then there's uh, Villa, who is a lion dog. He's like, he's he nearly comes up to my shoulder. That's how tall he is. He's absolutely massive. He's super gentle. And then there's Kia, who's a beagle. And poor Kia never gets to see any dogs. She doesn't even understand what play behavior is. So like when Pam sees her through the gate and runs up and Kia's really like excited and doesn't know what to do. And Pam does the little play bounces around. Kia just stares and goes, I don't understand what's happening. So it's really good that you're socializing your dog and yeah. early because it's going to pay off. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, she's pretty, she's always excited seeing other dogs. So um, that's actually something I'm really hoping that will mellow out when she grows older because it's it's kind of exhausting um like oh there's a dog i want to play with it and um but yeah that'll mellow out definitely but hopefully she always keeps it yeah um but at least um now um we met a uh, dog owner here with a um <clears throat> husky wolf hybrid and um very old dog like 12 years and um and again yuko was like oh, i want to play with it and <laughs> um the old dog actually um the owner said oh yeah she isn't interested in any other dogs but she actually you know was kind of interested in yuko and went to yuko and sniffed a little but when yuko was too um energetic in her approaches this old dog barked once and yuko was quiet so that was a really good experience for me to see okay when another dog actually like sets boundaries she follows them yeah that's that's really good because um I, I there's a lot any dog owners who don't really know about this and i'm gonna do a little like lecture as the owner of what's called a reactive dog uh, due to, as I described, problems that my dog had and having been dumped on the streets and abused and everything, she is terrified of other dogs. Um, so she will go off and start barking at them. And it's easy for people who don't, even people who own dogs, like I ran into someone a few days ago who their dog started really barking at us and Pam started having a panic attack. And the chap was like, oh, don't worry. He turned out to be from England, which is weird. Uh, we're on Gotland, so, but there's... There's literally dozens of us here. No, two dozen maybe. Um, anyway, uh, he was like, oh, he just wants to play. And I was like, you do not understand your dog. Your dog is full on aggression and my dog is in full panic and we got to get out of here. Um, but it's really good that, that you as well, you're getting to see those kind of things. And you and Yuko's encountered a dog who's been like, this is my boundary. And she's listened um, because so many people's dogs just do not do that. And they're just like, especially the little dogs, Little dogs, because you can handle them so easily. Uh, people are just perfectly happy to let them carry on. And it's like, no, your little dog, yeah, sure, for you, it's not a problem. But my dog doesn't see your dog as being small. My dog sees your dog as being like a very dominant, scary, nasty threat. And if it keeps attack coming in, she'll attack it. And your little dog doesn't have the slightest clue that my dog is kind of very muscular. Um, and yeah, she, she's, she's gentle as heck. But when she's not thinking, she can claw you quite badly. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got her. We actually, when she had some surgery, we had her, her nails medically trimmed down and we got a rounding file now. It's a little bit better, but she will always jump up and like just dig her claws in. Uh, that's just something we can't get out of her. Anyway, uh, this isn't about um, training dogs, but I was just saying, yeah. if you get um, a small dog and you do not put it through the kind of training car is doing, you shouldn't have a dog. If you don't want to train a dog, don't get a dog. That's it's that simple. It's part of the package, you know. Wow, this was a full-on PSA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important because, of course, like if dogs are misunderstood uh, to be aggressive because they're barking because you don't know the behavior, the the dog who is on the defensive can get pushed into a position where they do lunge out and bite because they feel so backed into a corner and afraid. Uh, and then the dog gets all the blame for being a bad dog. And it's like, no, that was a bad human uh, or a 
human with a bad dog. Like uh, immediately, if my dog's got problems with another dog, I will pick her up and we're leaving the area because no, I'm not letting it escalate. But then there's people who just let their dogs keep going. Anyway, uh, board games. Yeah. Um, so um, someone else. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> you name them. <laughs> Alessio. Oh yeah. So what's going on for me? Uh, a lot of any things. dog stories. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I could share some dog stories, but they are all in the neighborhood, and there's some some dogs like stra- like not exactly strays because they have an owner, but they there are small runs who go around the neighborhood, and uh, mm. uh, we leave uh, some meat for them, some leftovers and stuff, but they are not that well behaved, so. I I could share a lot of stories, but I have to prepare them because I don't actually know how to approach the subject at the moment. So (laughs) that's basically it. Uh, About games, on the other hand, I have mostly two things which are just stuff progressing because I finally... I'm finally playing my People of the Dreamkeeper campaign. I know I, I said this in the last catch-up, but while it looks like two weeks for you, it was actually a bit more than a week. So I'm at Lantern Year 4 since then. and uh, The first uh, boring yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that... it, I, it's the butcher again. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I, I'm being facetious. The butcher is actually fun and a perfectly fine inclusion. And I understand and accept that they've used some monsters from the core game. And the butcher is one who I have no problem coming from the core game into any campaign. It's always a good time. Yeah, exactly. I uh, actually have to play the fourth year, so no, no butcher yet. I fully expect to destroy it because I was a bit of lucky. I was a bit on the easy side on the first years. Uh, the Crimson Crocodile was wonderful, but I, I, I feel it like it is a bit easy. Um, it's the, the one point in toughness from eight to seven is yeah. a huge difference, but um it does have enough mechanics that i think is a good learning balanced kind of level one type monster Uh, it's the smog singers i have concerns about yeah the level one doesn't do anything because it's all its mechanics need lots of health yeah exactly the level one of the smog singers which i just faced well uh I have to say that I am impressed with the thematic design because I guess that's intentional that you hate them. I I hate yeah. them. Yeah, to, well, they're, yeah. They're, they're, they're sirens. They're, 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 you know, playing on the trope of sirens. They're disgusting, um, prawn-like, <laughs> yeah. icky, body horror sirens. The uh, design is absolutely perfect. Yeah, and I, I believe... Well, you're supposed to hate them, and I certainly do. I despise them. <laughs> exactly. I, I, the f- I'm like, why are these survivors even remotely feeling guilty? But there's some fun mechanics when guilt gets too high, where it's like, <laughs> oh boy, this survivor doesn't actually feel guilty. They really hate them as well. So um, I will say, it. I think the f- fight starts to come to life at two, when they get a lot more wounds. Um, and the level three fight is the first time I felt as if yeah, this is what the scenario was designed around. The showdown is designed around this. This my, showdown, yeah. my, my My thing was, um, when I first time I fought them, they popped the full... Like, I got two resources from the starting event. I got a resource on the way in on the hunt. And then they popped out a full set of, of singer armour between all of that and the showdown <laughs> fight. And I was just like, okay, so... Oh, boy, this is better than leather. Ooh. <laughs> I don't care about the ballad synergy at all. This is just really good. This is what I want node two monster armor to be um uh, as you can tell we've gone off tangent because i'm really excited because i think despite my misgivings on the smog singers on the showdown side i do think there's some really good stuff there some great world building there's some great thematics and i think the crimson crocodile is like an all-time great it's it's phenomenal yeah uh anyway that's i i for probably a better impression the crimson crocodile is beautiful i love the learning curve i i think that there is a lot 
to process in the first lantern. Actually, in the very first lantern year, I think I had a settlement phase of one hour and something. Yeah. So, yeah. This, is, this is not for players who haven't played through a f- couple of campaigns. Uh, yeah, at exactly. least I would say you've gotten to the last boss of People of the Lantern before you start thinking about playing People of the Dreamkeeper because it is, it's a re, it's, it's a think. I'm, I'm going to say this. I was very apprehensive about the philosophies and knowledge system because forcing a new system into a game, um, like on mass, is quite a big risk. Uh, and what the uh, the stuff they were showing us wasn't enough. Yeah, on the Kickstarter, the hints were not enough to produce any confidence. But I think I can say, and I am Trent. Uh, also, Trent Dennison, Big Dino, also said this, uh, and I totally agree with him. I don't think I'm going back to playing without the um, philosophy system. The I'm not gonna. Kara hasn't played yet, so I'm not gonna mention the card. But the first, um, co- I think it's the first or second cognitive one. The one you get that involves not having to have um, complete amounts of things. If you get what I'm hinting at. Oh, not yet possible. It's second it's go- cognitive is the. Is the weapon prof- weapon proficiency? Right? No, 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 no. That's way further in. That's no. Um, like it's milestone two or three. Um, no. I'm talking about. First one is philosophy. Second one. Oh, I have to get the manual. I'm not. I there. think it's <laughs> the stone. I think the second one's stone plate. It's what you unlock with stone plate. I yeah. think is one of the best pieces of design oh, yeah. they've ever done. That uh, I think if I didn't play with philosophies, I would just be importing that mechanic anyway because it is really is something the game needed. Yeah, actually, I also like the scouts. Uh, they basically go in unprotected the first time you bring them, but uh, the scout mechanism I found it refreshing too. So, I, I like it, but they pitched it to us that we could have the scouts, yeah. but we would decide if they were going to go into the showdown or not. I wanted like that experience of the scout with the option of going in. I, I'm i not so keen on them being in all the time. I think on that front, scouts might be the mechanic I end up not playing with, um, except to play people of the Dreamkeeper because they're compulsory. Uh, yeah, it, it, I like the model. I like the concept. Um, I I'm starting to get the level three um, related stuff that happens. That's all very yeah. That's that's very cool. Uh, but um, and they there is situations they're helpful, but I just don't think it's for me. I don't think I want to be forced to be gambling my gear every single time because it's I've stopped playing risky. I I'm destroying monsters with the most like I can because I'm looking at this and going I am being forced if I lose this showdown to lose my gear or I have to go through the process of the recovery phase with the scout and that's not guaranteed. Uh, I'm I'm not down for this, so I'm terribly sorry, monsters, but I am not going in unless I'm going to absolutely wreck you. Um, which it's removed the ri- it's removed the risky part from the game for me I've stopped playing with risky stuff like I even stopped playing with noisy gear which I was doing for a little bit because I was like Exa- exactly. I don't want to go into a showdown where my ham fluter wielding survivor as amazing as it is just dies on the way in because I could lose everything um, but some people may love that so why are we, we, we no stop stop <laughs> We need to stop. We're not going to do a catch up for me. All that the listeners need to know for me is uh, uh, I was late to the recording because my dog disappeared. Um, yeah. she, we have a tracker on her. Uh, so I was charging my phone at the time. So it was in another room. So I was like, oh, goodness, did it ping to say she wandered off? Because she's escaped four times now. Um, and <laughs> she's even crossed the road. And the road outside our house, as Cara can attest, cars go really fast across there along there. They do not respect that this is actually a neighborhood because it's a main road going through a rural um, like suburb. Uh, yeah, so it was a bit of a heart, heart in mouth moment and, until I got in the house and I was like grabbing my phone. It was the sh- First of all, the app went, oh, a GP not online. And I was like, oh, no, GPS. Um, uh, how am I going to find her now? And then it went, oh, no, she's she, it is online. Hello. She's in the it, it, within the borders we set for home. And I was like, OK, does that mean the track has fallen off? Because that's happened before. Um but it turned out she'd gone upstairs to the gaming attic to play a few board games. So uh, and she just didn't tell me that's what she was doing. Uh, she doesn't usually go up there unless I'm up there. So it was a bit of a bit of a shock. So that's that's it. Uh, we're going to talk about Kingdom Death Monster, I think, fully in a 
another episode in the future when we can get Alexis yeah, and Audrey available and we'll probably talk about maybe the first 12 years I think is reasonable um, yeah I think I'll go I, I think I'll get to the principal conviction yeah Lantern near 12 possibly yeah. Yeah, I'll get there this week that's a, that's I think that's a good like it's not quite halfway through the campaign but let's be honest once you get past Lantern Year Twelve, Kingdom Death has that horrible dry spell through the teens where you're kind of you're grinding out if you don't have extra monsters in you're grinding out and people of the Dream Keeper, uh, well, <laughs> Phoenix yay uh, so we'll anyway. see <laughs> yeah and maybe Kara will play or or maybe not you haven't decided yet I'm not Kara? sure you just said. One should only uh, play it when one reaches the final boss of uh, People of the Lantern. I have never managed to get past the Watcher, so... Oh, you're missing out. Like, the the final boss... Um, I mean, there's been a lot of discussions of how the narrative isn't great on it, but the actual showdown is brilliant. It's really good. Like... Yeah, maybe, I, but the, the Watcher is kind of... I, I, I found this showdown really confusing... And I, I poor watcher. I, 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 uh. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the main tip is popping the watcher as early as you possibly can, because the watcher is weaker when you do that. The yeah. retinues, yeah, they are. Um, they add a lot to the whole showdown, and the yeah. watcher itself is is moderately complicated. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have a decent population, you usually don't lose to the watcher just because it's vulnerable to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And well, it's, you can it's just send people over. Yeah. It's also got that design left over from the very first edition where the Watcher is it's meant to be the last fight, of, which it was, and it was designed like that. So it has the epic feeling of the whole settlement coming together. Um, so you do have deep reserves of all those extra survivors who can keep coming in. So, yeah, as long as you've got the population, you should be able to beat it. Um, but that's, like, I think the first most important skill for any player is learning what a reasonable population number is. And it's higher than what you think it is. Um, for me, um, I my people of the Dreamkeeper campaign, uh, I have not let it drop under twenty five, and yeah, I'm trying to hold 30. it at thirty. Um, because yeah, you end up with some survivors just get crippled and become useless, and you're like, okay, well, um, I'll leave them in the settlement, or uh, um, one of them develops a philosophy that is quite problematic and you go, I'm not taking you on hunts anymore, buddy. We're going to deal with you when we get sacrifice. Yeah, I, I got the scout uh, that as soon as it was nominated scout, he, he, he got uh, minus one accuracy and evasion. So yep, that's that was, basically breeding. <laughs> that, that, was, that was my first scout. They're still alive because yeah. I haven't had an opportunity to kill them off because the... The, the game, I, it, like the death settlement event card, I think is super interesting and cool, but I've never wanted to sacrifice a survivor who's got no hunt XP to it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm always like, mm, you've got one hunt XP, where you go? Um, so I've never got round to killing off my very first scout, and I think at this point, Badge of Honor, they can make it to the end if I get there, which I'm on track Anyway. To. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about other We've gotten back to Kingdom Death, so let, let's get away from that um, uh, and leave it for <laughs> the, the the recording we'll probably do in a few weeks, a month time, whatever, um, once we it's figure a out trap. where everyone is. Yeah. Uh, so, Kara, uh, tell us all about Eos, Island of Angels. Yes, so, Eos, Island of Angels, the newest release of King Raccoon Games, uh, designed by Felix Maticat, with whom we had an interview a while back, uh, mostly about Tsukuyumi, but we did touch on Eos a little at this point. Yeah, it was before the... Uh, either Eos Kickstarter was about to land, or it was a little bit before it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, Episode I... 25. What? Uh, it was an advertisement. Episode 25. Oh my god, yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, so anyway, um, the most important thing about this game, my name is in it as a playtester, so... Um... Woohoo! <laughs> Narcissist much? So it, it must be deserved. Good. And um, so yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so what is this game? Um, Basically, it's a kind of worker placement, uh, engine building race, somehow. Um, so the game is about uh, Eos, the Island of Angels, which in the 
lore, which I only just read. Um, I believe like two years ago, well, three years ago, when I started playtesting, I was told the lore and never bothered with it again. And I kind of forgot it. So just before this recording, I, I just read again w what it's about. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> basically, the, in the past, there was this island, Eos, and uh, some bad things happened and it was covered in, in smoke and... Um, so it became this like blank spot on maps that every ship just, you know, passed because uh, whenever someone went into the smoke, they never came out. So um, people just stayed clear. It made trading routes longer and whatever. Um, until one day, some adventurer with his crew decided, no, we, we can do this, went in there. And actually, two weeks later, came out the other side with an angel on board. Uh, like uh, an actual, like like celestial being. And um, this angel told the world, look, all my brothers and sisters are trapped on this island, uh, trapped by demons. Um, you want clear trading routes, so we make a deal. When I go back to heaven, I summon some strong winds that blow away the smoke, so you can travel there, but as, uh, you know... Um, as payment for this, you will have to free my brothers and sisters. Um, so the island got cleared and there are all these uh, entrapped angels trapped in stone and uh, demons around them. And um, each player controls a faction uh, that sends a ship to, yeah, um, like... Uh, collect glory and fame because it's kind of glorious to to fight demon lords and uh, well to win against demon lords at least and um free angels um and yeah that's what this game is about so you control a crew of a ship um with five members um you have a uh, like damn it i have it in german so i i have to to translate things um <clears throat> Like uh, the the person who controls the 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 the, the wheel, <laughs> um, then the first officer, the quartermaster. Uh, um, oh, the, the helmsman. The, the the helmsman. Yes, helmsman, first officer, quartermaster. Um, someone who uh, watches over your finances and a warrior and. Um, <clears throat> and then you have your your ship. Um, and the the game loop is pretty simple. Um, when it's your turn, you um, have you, you take a worker from your ship and place it on one of your heroes um, that doesn't have a worker on it yet. Yeah? And then you do the action that this hero provides. Um, sometimes you have to pay uh, gold to activate them. But anyway, you do this action and then you do a, a bonus action on the bottom of your board and um, that's your turn. As soon as you have placed at least one worker on your board, instead, in your turn, you can basically take all the workers on your board back onto your ship, you know, reset your board, and uh, your ship has the spots for your workers, and when you take them off, you free the spots, and they show some bonuses, and when you reset everything, you get the bonuses that are open. So. If you wait until all your five workers are placed, you get more bonuses. Um, so, and that's basically the game loop. Um, <clears throat> there is one special action uh, you can choose instead of your five uh, heroes. That's the chronic action, um, where you either uh, awaken an angel or you uh, fight a demon lord, or you do some other heroic deed. At the start of the game, you place four heroic deeds and one demon lord on the board and um, basically you can go to these heroic deeds you have to pay some costs um, <clears throat> maybe get some demons in the process or discard some adventure cards or pay gold or whatever and um, then make a chronic action then you did this heroic deed which also is pretty cool and um, as soon as you do one of these three things you place a marker on the chronic track and uh, once the last spot on the chronic track is uh, marked by a player, the game ends and everyone else has one more turn and then you count victory points. Um, 
it becomes a little more complicated when you look at um, the details because the gameplay loop is pretty simple, but there is a lot going on. And um, as there is an engine building aspect, you can um, upgrade your um, heroes in three different ways. And um, so later on um, during the game, a turn might become just more, yeah? not just, okay, yeah, I do this, I pay this much gold and I, I move two steps. But it might be like, okay, so I pay this gold, then I get to roll this dice, I get to um, <clears throat> draw two cards and play a card, then I get to upgrade another hero, move one spot and uh, get turn gold in the end. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool because I like engine building. If you don't like engine building, I don't think you'll find it cool, but... <laughs> Yeah, I actually, find, I actually find that this aspect is the most important with uh, worker placement, engine building uh, hybrids. Uh, you must start with rules which will stay fixed throughout all the game, but at the beginning you will be starved for action, and in the end you must combo with the hell of everything everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, that's um... fun. <laughs> yeah, and... Um... Yeah, um... I mean, that's mostly it. Um, when you awaken an angel, you get the angel on your ship. And um, there are two options how to handle it. You can either say, okay, yeah, I have it as my, you know, guardian angel now, which means you um, can ignore a curse of a demon lord because every demon lord that spawned has a curse attached to it that influences all players in some negative way. Oh, oh my and God. if you have a guardian angel on your ship, you can say, oh, this turn, I ignore this specific curse of this demon lord. Uh, for example, one demon lord has a curse that says, you can't earn money over 30 gold. Yeah? So as soon, if you have 20 gold and you would get 20, you only have 30. You can't get over 30 gold. Um, and if you need, want to do an action that costs 50 and you have a guy and you might say, hey, you know, I ignore this curse so I can earn more money now and then I can do this action next turn. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the one option. The other option is you take the angel as is. Uh, each angel has some special ability. Uh, some angels are like additional heroes you can use or some angels give you permanent bonuses, like one angel gives you free shields, which means whenever you would get demons on your ship, there are the demon lords, and then there are the small, you know, imps that swarm your ship and um, basically make you slower and uh, worst case, uh, do it so you can't upgrade your heroes or whatever. Um, and shields reduce the number of demons you get. Yeah, So one um, angel says, hey, now you have free shields as long as I'm on your ship. So Whenever you get demons, you get three demons less, which is pretty strong because most of the times you get two or three demons, so no demons. Um, <clears throat> yeah, or um, another angel just says, hey, ignore all curses if you have me on your ship. Yeah? Um, so they are very different, all with individual art by Felix Mertikat, which is awesome. And um, yeah, um, the heroic deeds, also sometimes come with uh, specific rewards uh, like some item in my one game uh, I st still have set up behind me. I uh, got this item that uh, meant that when I reset my board, one of the bonuses I got, I could double. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different things going on with this pretty simple game loop, um, which I really like. Um, Personally, I also really like to, to see how it turned out in the end, because just before the recording, I, I skimmed through all my um, uh, Twitch Latest recordings, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I, I streamed all the playtest sessions I was part of, and um, it's so different now. And I, I think it, it's really interesting. I, I guess m most games go through a lot of very big iterations and changes during their development. And when you're actually part of it and look at the final game, it, things make so much more sense. I, I believe when you look at this game, 
there are some things where you would go like, hmm, why did they do it like that? And now I can say, well, because every other option was just bad. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, um, I think it's a really interesting game. It um, it's, has great table presence. Um, if you could see uh, my camera right now, you, you would yeah. see it. But um, it has um, a lot of variety in it uh, because, you know, you it's random which demon lords spawn, it's random which angels are in play, uh, it's random which heroic deeds are around. Um, <clears throat> depending on what factions you play, like in the um, core game there are five factions, it's a one to five player game, and then there is a, an expansion with two more factions. They are all asymmetric, they do have all the same types of heroes, um, four of which all more or less do the same thing, but differently, like the Helmsman always is for traveling on the map. The um, first, uh, the uh, Quartermaster is always about the adventure cards, you know, drawing cards, playing cards, which gives you some bonus. Uh, the one with the money always is for giving you money and the warrior is always for fighting demons. The first officer is always faction specific. Yeah? Um, so in one faction, um, the first officer is actually able to kill demon lords, um, for which you normally need to have freed an angel and use the angel to kill the demon uh, lord. Um, this one faction can do it without freeing angels. Um, <clears throat> another faction uh, has um, a first officer that plays more cards, so they focus a lot on playing these cards. And yeah, that's pretty cool. So each play changes depending on which factions are in play, because if you have the one that can kill demon lords without angels, well, guess what they will do? They travel around the map and kill demon lords. And um, <clears throat> yeah, then um, a lot of variety with the adventure cards. There are also specific goal cards uh, that give you victory points if you reach certain criteria, those are randomized. And um, so no two plays are the same. And um, if you still think it's after, I don't know, 50 plays or whatever, that it's kind of boring, you can flip the board and there is a night side um, with some um, twists to the rules, um, with some changes to the map, and um, yeah, new game basically. Nah, I, I gotta new say, game, but... if you're bored with the game after fifty plays, I think the game's done its job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I can't tell you if it's boring after fifty plays. I'm pretty sure I have more than fifty plays by now, but I have all these different iterations. With the newest one, I only have two plays actually so um well you know i was almost gonna ask um how how uh what the playtesting experience was like as a as a whole um Life really in interesting yeah it, yeah it was really interesting but also really frustrating um you need to understand um basically they had two parts of playtesting one side was uh, where I was involved was basically the German side, yeah, all the German playtesters, and then they um, 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 cooperated with. Uh, uh, no, wait, it should be on here somewhere. Um, Grey Fox Games, yeah, with Grey Fox Games for the uh, international distribution, and at some point uh, there was this part in the playtest where we did our playtest sessions and we said oh yeah you know we like this part a really much that should stay but part b that's bad that should go <laughs> yeah and the next iteration had it part a removed yeah. but part b <laughs> built up more and that happened a couple of times and me and the other playtesters were really like what the fuck is going on? Yeah, why, why don't they listen to us? Until we learned, yeah, Grey Fox Games also does playtests with American players, and they have a very different take to us German players. 
<laughs> it's almost like the uh, old classic board game like uh, uh, growth came from three different places uh, America, Germany and the UK and each one has a very different sort of take on how things uh, are in the world of board games almost yeah I mean that it's actually I always thought yeah that's just a, a, a joke people do with you know Ameritrash and Americans who like randomness and whatever while uh, Germans like you know uh, structure and and uh, very intricate designs and cubes, whatnot. So, uh, cubes. Yes, actually, cube. <laughs> the first iteration you, in the first iteration you actually had on your player board uh, twenty five white cubes on different spots, which you removed <laughs> uh, during the game. Now you have five white cubes. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so but it actually was noticeable during this playtest. The German playtesters liked these crunchy, intricate things where you really sat there and had to think for five minutes, okay, how am I doing this now and how do these things interact? While apparently the American playtesters really liked, hey, let's get some mechanic that randomizes stuff and uh, so I do something and I don't know what will happen. And So um, th that was qu quite interesting experience. Um, there were, of course, some developments um, that I felt weren't weren't good. Um, I actually like the, the the second to last iteration had me kind of worried with the game um, because the, I, I'm I'm not sure what it was, but there was there were some changes where I thought, ah, now it's not really fun anymore. Um, but the last iteration seems really great. Like from what I've seen now, um, how they pulled it all together and um, finalized it. That's, um, yeah, pretty amazing. Is it going to retail? Yes. Um, the retail version um, will have some changes, like the, the Kickstarter version is the deluxe version, which comes with um, you know, instead of standees for the angels and demon lords, halt, um, basically uh, like, like wooden figures, um, which I, I actually like in my first play now, I used the wooden figures and they always <laughs> fell over. And uh, in the second play, I used the standees with the nice artwork from Felix. So... <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I don't think you're missing much there. No, well, um, if you've got a choice, you should always pick a standee. Yeah, yeah. We are uh, the, the one thing that I think is worth the deluxe version, I'm not sure how it's with retail, if they have like, if you can get the deluxe upgrade stuff or so, the, the, the nation boards are too layered. Um, so your cubes have nice slots to fit in. Um, <clears throat> But I mean, it's I, I believe it's still playable if you don't have a dual lay, layered board. Uh, apart from that, there are additional uh, adventure cards. I mean, I don't think it makes much of a difference if you have. Let me check. Um, if you have sixty or uh, eighty-five, but I, you won't play that that many cards anyway. Um, <clears throat> some new heroic deeds. I think in the game there are, I don't know, 20, 25 heroic deeds now, and each play you use four. So, yeah. um, so I think the, the not deluxe version is, is fine. Um, and then they have the expansion for the uh, two extra factions. Um, can, don't have to buy it. Um, but yeah, it will definitely come to retail. Um, I can't tell you how it's with the deluxe stuff, if that will be available in some way. Um, it will be totally fine without the deluxe stuff. Um, the one thing you might miss is the two dual layered player boards, but... Um... I actually have one important thing to to share about lore, because I have this thought when, when you read us the lore, and basically there's this island where there are these magic guardians uh, who are in peril somehow and there, there's this uh, wizard sage who tells you to go on a boat and fill your boat with these guardians 
before it's too late because the enemies are coming to get them. That's Isle of Cats. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> totally. So yeah, basically it's Isle of Cats with angels. Yeah, <laughs> that's some, not the case. <laughs> so, some people would argue cats are angels. I would say you're a complete <laughs> idiot. Terry Pratchett said it best that if cats look like frogs, we know what awful evil things they actually are. <laughs> they are their sinister agendas. Yeah, they, they literally transmit parasites into humans that make them love them. They are the smog singers. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> Your Honor, I have no other questions. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really have any, any more questions. Um, uh, it does sound rather interesting. I do like a good engine builder. Uh, hmm. How's, how's, have you played it? Does it have a solo? I can't remember. Does it have a solo? Yeah, it has a solo mode. What's that um, like? The, that was actually also interesting during playtest because for the longest time it didn't have a solo mode. And at some point... Um, I got invited into like a closed off section on the Discord and they said, hey, look, we are thinking about doing this, but we don't know if it's working. So don't tell anyone, uh, but we're trying a solo mode. And um, <clears throat> basically how it's in the end now, um, you draw at random or you can choose a um, mission card for the solo mode. Um, so it's not about, you know, uh, collecting victory points and reaching a certain limit, but basically the sm this mission card gives you tasks you have to fulfill in a set order with limited time. Um, so the solo mode is basically this puzzle where you sit there, you have the board, you have your player board and you figure out, okay, how do I approach this? Yeah. How can I, um, <clears throat> awaken angel at first then uh, um, have seven ranks on my heroes increased then have 150 coins collected and then do two heroic deeds um, without the time running out um, right and... so it's a bunch of goals to achieve in the scenario rather than like beating your own score it's like yes yeah cool and it has I think it's ten yeah ten different um goal cards or scenario cards for the single player. Um, so I, I think that's a way better solution than the, hey, if you reach 100 points, you are mediocre. If you reach 120, you are above average. And if you get 200 points, you're an angel admiral. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't like I, I'm not a big fan of those. Yeah, There's some games I think it works quite <clears> well <throat> for. Um, then like, Automata sometimes could be great and sometimes can be a lot of extra effort that you're not really looking for. I kind of like what you're describing here, which is you sit down and there's sort of, am I right? It's like a set, effectively a semi -gener randomly generated puzzle and goals. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, try and do this within this length of time. That's cool. And also like the length of time is uh, determined. Basically, um, you may reset your board five times. Uh, that's how it's structured. So... Um, that's another part of the puzzle, like, okay, can I afford to reset it before having placed all my workers? Because that gives me more flexibility, but at the same time, it advances the time faster. So, um, yeah. Very cool. Great, great. Okay, so interestingly, uh, that does mechanically flow into my topic, uh, which is some good old-fashioned 10-year-old card-based role-playing with the absolutely mealy mouthful of a card title, Pathfinder, the adventure card game Rise of the Rune Lords, and then I'm not going to read every single different se section and chapter hiding and box that comes in this as part of a thing because it's a number of expansions um but i'm going to talk about the whole rise of the rune lords campaign as an entire thing and uh this is actually a 2013 game so i'm doing this around somewhere this year it'll be having its 10th anniversary um it's from mike selinka who i think is a really good designer he's done a lot of great things and it adapts the rise of the rune lords pathfinder campaign into a card form giving you kind of a it's it's build in some cases as a deck builder 
Um, it is technically a deck builder, but it's not really your traditional kind of deck builder. We'll get into the mechanics. But it's more of like an adventuring, role-playing type game with a lot of the flavour and actual role-playing shaved off and you're down with a tight set of mechanics. So um, the this story has like, there's some ancient evil has woken up in the ancient land of Varasia. There's magic thrumming around, giants gathering and causing all sorts of trouble, cultists murder, and a bunch of maniacal goblins setting fire to the peaceful town of Sandpoint. You know, just a, a Saturday night in any generic fantasy world. Um, so you will sit down, you play this for like one to four players, you can buy an expansion that puts it up to six players, it will scale from one hero to six heroes, there's different challenges, um, and the characters are all better with different player numbers so that in itself is quite interesting um i think one good example is the cleric is better in larger group numbers because she's very support orientated um but we'll get into that so very start you get your box and it comes with the base stories and it comes with the first adventure in the series there's six adventures and there's the character add-on pack, which will add the 5th and 6th player and enough cards to cover the 5th and 6th player. And there's also loads, loads of additional stuff. I'll briefly outline some of the extras and the um, other campaigns near the end of this. And give my, my I'm going to probably touch back on these in the future because I'm essentially working my way towards talking about Apocrypha. Because Apocrypha is amazing. Um, it uses a similar system to Pathfinder, but a very different world and some changes in mechanics. So, start of the uh, entire thing, you'll pick a character to play. These are the iconic heroes from the Pathfinder universe. Um, and in some of them uh, are, cross are crossing over into uh, Kingdom Death as well. They'll be having their own Pathfinder-related expansion oh. one day eventually. Yeah. Right, there was Pai, something. Pai, yeah? so the, the name of the company behind Pathfinder is Paizo. Paizo. We were talking, yeah, we were talking about with Car about that. I didn't remember the name of the company. Paizo, yeah. Paizo, Paizo yeah. crossover. Yeah. I, I believe the four characters that are going to be in the Kingdom Death expansion are Valoros, Sioni, Kyra, and Merisil. Um, and Ky I just want to say, like, uh, Kyra and Merisil are my favorites. They're they're they're, they're married. It's like, this is such a progressive world, the Pathfinder world. I, you can't really tell by the names, but these are two lovely ladies. Um, but they're mm -hmm. a really diverse cast and a vet, a, like just such a different range of the way they all are. Um, one of my personal favourites is Amari, who is just this badass, I'll wield a giant gut-sized sword barbarian, and she's just, she hits things very hard. Anyway, let's actually get on to mechanics. Um, so you'll pick your character, and... You get a card to represent your character as they move around to different locations. More on that in a moment. And you get a little bit of text on the back that, that like adds story to who the given character is. Um, I think there's 11 characters you can get in total, but you can get a lot more from all the other packs. But I believe I have 11 characters here in this box. Um, and I think that's everything from the base set and the character add-on pack. Although I feel like I should be counting 12. Um, 11 seems like an odd number, maybe it is that. I didn't manage to find out the right number in preparation. My bad. Um, anyway, so your character will then have a um, character sheet card, which you're going to want to sleeve, because it has a bunch of little boxes on it. And this is literally like your classic D&D &D type character thing. So uh, Amari, who here, uh, she has strength, and she gets a D12 in strength. Um, so that's her best attribute, and specifically in melee, um, she gets plus two, so she's like very good at hitting things with weapons. Then she has dexterity, it's a d6, that's pretty bad. Uh, constitution, a d8, it's okay. Intelligence is a d4. Wisdom, a d6, with a plus three survival, a plus three bonus in specifically the survival skill, because she's a barbarian. She's good at surviving in the wilderness. And then d6 charisma. Um, so... That kind of translates into your classic D&D. &D. You could look at Amari of being like 18 strength and around 15 constitution, that kind of thing. Um, and it, so it, it translates very well. And uh, she also has like a hand size. Um, she starts with four, which is a little low. Uh, most characters start with five. You can 
which we'll get, I'll talk about it in a moment. You can upgrade these sheets. Uh, and then she has like um, a proficiencies, in her case, weapons and light armor. And she has two specific abilities unique to being a barbarian. In her case, she can bury a card. More on those mechanics later. They're really cool. To give her um, plus 1d10 to a strength melee or constitution check. So that's like her barbarian rage. Um, and additionally, she has an ability where she's actually allowed to move at the end of a... Um, at the end of a t her turn, which is actually... I guess that represents her ability to wander from place to place, but it's just actually a very useful ability. On the back, um, you have... And this is the deck building part. You have a list of the cards you're allowed to have in your deck. Um, initially, they have to be basic cards. So they'll have a basic keyword on them. Nothing fancy. But as you adventure and you encounter boons as they're called if you successfully manage to pass the check to keep them then they'll go into your hand and they'll go into your discard pile and then at the end of the scenario you'll get to readjust your ha your deck to take any of the new cards you want but you're limited in what you can have in there so amari here is allowed five weapons no spells um she's obviously not a wild um, magic barbarian um two armor cards two items two allies and four blessings and every character will have different numbers. These, again, can be upgraded. Uh, certain points during the campaign, you'll get the option to upgrade stuff. So, um, like, she, you can improve her strength. She'll get extra pluses. Uh, that's how the characters become more effective at doing what they want to do. So she can go all the way up to a plus four strength bonus, um, which I believe stacks on with the melee to give it, like, plus six. Very powerful um, in combat. Um, and then you can increase, say, the amount of weapons she can have. She can go all the way up to eight weapons in her deck if you want to add more um, pips to those whenever you're allowed to upgrade it. The last thing about the character is they also all have a favoured card type. This means this is a card type that you're guaranteed to get in your opening hand. So if you don't have it, you'll essentially get to draw one and sort bits and pieces out. Uh, and you all have one in your starting hand always. So Amari always has a weapon to start with, meaning she's ready to rock. She's never caught without something to swing around. Um, then we have the actual adventures themselves. So I'm just going to talk about the very first one. It's called Brigandoom, um, a contracted portmanteau. Uh, and this one is like a bunch of bandits are harassing the area. And the goal within these is you're trying to find a particular villain um, and defeat them. So the scenario will list a bunch of locations that occur within a given um, uh, scenario. It's just a fly, Pamsha. It's okay. Oh, she's been, <laughs> she, she's been harassed by a fly and she likes to catch them and toy with them. Go on, you go. You get the fly. Um, yeah, anyway, sorry. So then you'll have a location like, say, the farmhouse. And then it'll tell you how many of each card type is in the location. So the farmhouse, for example, has three monsters um, and one weapon, one um, item. No, sorry, three items, one ally, no blessings, and a card type that I'm forgetting the icon for, which I should absolutely know. Um, but I'm not going to worry about it. But anyway, so that's like what goes into the deck. And you'll draw those from the collective piles of cards that are available for that particular scenario. It will be used to begin with. Um, and you'll also take a set of the villain and their henchmen and shuffle them up. And each location will get one of those. And it's all shuffled in. And then you'll lay out each location. Say with um, two players, you might have three locations. With six players, you might have seven, six Usually, I think six is as high as it goes, but you'll have like more locations. And um, then you will take a, all the blessings that are available and deal out a certain number of them, like say 25 or 30, and that creates the clock. So that's what I was talking about with this kind of puzzle where things are set up a bit randomly to begin with. And then you've got a finite amount of time to solve the problem. In this case, it's you're trying to find where the villain is located and defeat them. But very importantly, if you just defeat them and there are other locations still open, which means they have cards in them, that villain can run away. So you need to go to each location and deal with all the problems there. If you find the henchmen, they give you a chance to close the location early, um, which is nice because it saves a lot of time. Uh, 
but obviously finding other cards allows you to upgrade your character as they're rummaging through the farmhouse. They're like, oh, look at this, suit of plate armor, fantastic. You know, because farmers keep plate armor, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, uh, if you've got to deal with ravaging goblins, setting fire to your farmhouse, you know, maybe a retired knight. Who knows? That's the part of the game where you're kind of left to build the emergent storytelling. And if you're playing with friends, you'd be like, why on earth does this farmer have this incredible magical spear here? What What's that about? Um, so, yeah, it's it's a little bit fun on that front, even though there's not a lot of proper real role playing in the traditional sense of describing and, and playing the characters. It's more just I mean, mechanics. to be fair, if you play D&D with rules as written, you do have random loot tables. Yeah, so. that's true. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's kind of the loop is you'll have the scenario and the scenario will have a specific rules for it. Um, for example, the bandit Brigadoon um, scenario is if one of the monster's power causes you to recharge one or more cards, do so then draw the same number of cards you recharged. So recharging, which I'll get into, is basically you have to take a card in your hand and stick it on the bottom of your deck, um, which would reduce your hand size. And that's actually what bandits do. It represents some kind of stealing something from you, um, pilfering it. Uh, and then it tells you what the henchmen are. In this case, they're all bandits. And then the villain, um, who is Jubarali Vishki. And the neat part of that is that's where a bit of the story is. So each villain usually has a, a little bit of flavor text on them to explain something about them. Uh, Jube Rally is like just a general murderer, grave robbing, conspiring, blackmailing. He's even got crimes against decency. So, you know, he's a terrible person. He probably exposed himself in the park like Gary Boosie. Uh, yeah, so um, that's that's all the setup. And on your turn, you will draw a blessing card. Um, Usually all that represents, it goes into a discard pile and normally it just represents like passing of time um, to count your turns. But sometimes you'll have cards that may interact with the specific blessing you've drawn off the deck, which is kind of nice. Um, and then you have an explore. So you can choose to draw the top card from the deck or you could go, I'm going to move somewhere else before I draw my card. Um, and... Then if it's a boon, you'll have a check to try and acquire it. Like if it's a weapon, it might require strength. Or if it's a spell, it might require arcane magic, divine, intelligence, wisdom. They're all very thematic. Sometimes they have multiple checks. Um, so that's how you'll find more, more stuff. Um, and you'll get a chance to tailor your deck as you go along and be like, I like how this weapon works. I don't like this weapon. I like the combo between these two particular cards. So I'm interested in that. So I like these allies. I don't like these ones um which is it's nice you sort of gradually deck building as you go through the entire thing which feels like an adventurer building up their little party of hangers on and improving their gear as and when they find it is quite nicely thematic on that front um eventually you'll exhaust the deck or you'll find the henchman you'll find the villain and you'll like if you draw a monster or a henchman a villain or a Barrier, they're what's called Banes, um, and with a boon, failing, usually it doesn't matter, you just kind of lose the opportunity to discover that particular item. If you lose to a Bane or a monster, a villain, etc., then there'll be kind of a penalty. It can vary, like there can be a cave-in that sits on top of the deck and blocks any further progress through that location until you clear the stones out. You can be wandering through a forest and a, a bell can fall out of the sky onto you. That happened. And um, that was a fun moment for us. We were like, uh, was the bell like being carried by a dragon flying overhead? Or was it like wedged up in a tree? Or did it just spontaneously appear out of nowhere? We don't know. But now we're in a forest and this bell like hit, hit, hit one of us in the head. Um, so it's kind of fun on that front. It's a, it's a bit nonsensical emergent stories that then create fun moments where people get talking about how on earth did that happen? It brings the entire thing to life. Eventually, the goal is to try and close enough locations that you're down to, say, three is fairly good and f hunting for the villain. And 
the neat thing about this is you can either play all in the same location, working together and get through it quickly, or you can spread out and deal with a bunch of different locations, which can be helpful because when closing a location, you usually have to do a certain thing. Like maybe you have to fight a bandit or you have to pass a arcane check or a divine check or wisdom or survival. So each characters, they're going to be better at different things. Um, and that provides someone go, oh, brilliant, the forest. Yeah, I can deal with that. I'm the druid, no problem. While the barbarian goes, look, there's a bandit here at the, um, at the watchtower. So I'll deal with this because weapons are really efficient at de dealing with enemies because I don't discard them when I use them. I just keep reusing them because they're weapons. So yeah, that's the flow of the game. Uh, you either run out of time or you beat the villain. Um, when you encounter the villain, everyone who's not in the location with the villain has an opportunity to temporarily close their locations. So effectively, that stops the villain from running away. And if you've blocked all the villain's exits, bam, you beat them. Job done. Well done. Complete the scenario. Get the rewards. The um, neat, really neat part of this game that is so much fun is there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with your cards from your deck or can happen to your cards. So you'll have a hand and um, say five cards. That's the usual. And you can reveal cards, which means you, you show everyone the card. You go, I'm revealing this card, and you'll get the bonus. Often weapons, you just reveal them, and you get an extra dice in combat. And that keeps the card in your hand. Sometimes you have to discard the card to get the effect. Like spells, often you cast them by discarding them. And they'll go into the discard pile, and they will do, like, I don't know, you cast a fireball, or a lightning sparks, or something like that. Um, but, say, if you're a sorcerer, you'll also get a chance to make a check... And if you succeed, instead of discarding the card, you'll recharge it. And recharging is where you take a card and you put it on the bottom of your deck, which means eventually you will get to draw it again. And that's actually really important because if you try and draw a card from your deck and there's nothing left in there, you're, you're defeated. You've lost, you're out of the scenario. If everyone gets defeated, you lose. So the recharging and shuffling cards back into your deck is really helpful to give characters endurance. Uh, clerics and druids can get access to cure spells that will reach uh, will shuffle I think uh, yeah shuffle they'll shuffle a number of um, cards from the discard pile for anyone in their location back into the deck so they can run over and put some healing on the sorcerer who's she's been burning through a deck because Sione just like burns through her deck really fast and gets exhausted very quickly because sorcerers you know lots of spells lots of blessings lots of allies and they all get discarded to be used so there's a lot of that flavour. Um, finally, you can bury cards, which is you spend them by putting them under your character sheet. You can't use them for the rest of the scenario. And then some of them are banished, which is, means you lose it. You can't have it again unless you find a new copy out there in the game somewhere um, in a later scenario, or even maybe in the current scenario. It's like it's gone from your deck and it's it's gone back into the pool of cards that can be drawn. Like, a, say, a magic potion, yeah? You can only drink a potion once. One one dose. You drink it, you, then it's gone, so it gets banished. Or, say, a weapon or a piece of armour gets completely destroyed, protecting you, or broken over the head of a monster. Um, that gets banished as well. So this interplay of, like, recharging and discarding and revealing, burying and banishing, and trying to maintain your deck. Because um, you don't have to draw if your hand is full. So you can build a nice sustainable situation where you're like, I've got my armor, I've got my weapon, I've got um, a little bit of protection and I'm just going to sit on that. And I'm only going to like discard one card a turn and slowly go through my deck. But you can flip side of it, burn through a ton of cards. You can use blessings and allies to gain extra dice, to explore, but they always get discarded. Not always allies, but blessings almost always do. And that'll let you get through a location faster. So... Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of mechanics. You sit down at first and you're like, oh, well, I just go to a place and I draw a card, then I roll some dice. That doesn't seem like much. And then as you play more, you go, no, wait a minute. I go to a location and I um, play this spell that lets me look at the top cards of the deck. And oh, there's some monsters. Brilliant. I'll put them there. And then I won't explore because I don't do the fighting. I don't do the fighting at all. No, no, no. I'm a bard. Get lost. There's a barbarian here. Off you go. You deal with those problems. Um, and that provides all these synergies and back and forth and there's room for tons of different character play styles. Mechanically, it's it's brilliant. It is a really, really good game. And um, while there are different challenges at each player number and certain characters are better at lower numbers or higher numbers, this works from one to six players 
uh, fantastically. They'll take longer with more players. I like the three to four player size. That's like quite a nice amount to handle. And even playing solo, I will take three characters. Um, so yeah, that's that's like is fantastic. Now the negatives are you have a ton of different decks, and these decks all mix together into location decks. Um, and at the end of a scenario or while you're playing, you need to be very disciplined in separating everything out to the right place. So setup takes a fairly long time, and tear down can take a fairly long time. Um, but I enjoy the process of it. I like shuffling cards. Um, we talked about this before. I like I like decks. I like deck building. I like engine building. We're doing all of that. I like shuffling cards. All, all it's all stuff that makes me happy. Um, so that's uh, this a negative. The setup time. Uh, be aware of that. But if you're playing with other people, everyone can like join in and help out. You can be like, okay, you're in charge of doing the monsters. You're in charge of the barriers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so you can share the load and get it done more quickly. If you get a deck set up wrong, of course, you're not going to realise until suddenly you're like, oh, wait a minute, this this isn't right. And you may not even notice, but heck, you know, it's, it, mistakes happen. It's a cooperative game. You don't worry too much about it. You just try and not make that mistake again in the future. Um, it's, it's really fun. Uh, so the main criticism that gets levelled at Rise of the Rune Lords is it's a bit too easy. Uh, I think it's not too easy. I think it's right for people who are first learning this system because there is still a lot and it's nice that this game is fairly gentle um, and eases you into it and doesn't really turn the screws on too hard with anything overwhelming or crazy. So it's fantastic to learn. Additionally, you can just get this as a mobile app or a on Steam. I think it's pretty cheap. I can't remember how much I paid. You never have to worry about setup and tear down. You never have to worry about um, like having your decks correct and all of that stuff because the computer, the, the the app will always remind you when you need to change your deck to fix things because you've got too many of one card in after a scenario, etc. It won't ever get the henchmen wrong or the villains wrong or anything like that. It'll always apply all of the rules for locations and scenarios. So that's like an option to play it that's fairly cost effective. It's definitely cheaper than buying the physical copy. It only has Rise of the Rune Lords and I think the Goblin campaign and some promo stuff. There's also some weird oddities where you can get more powerful cards far earlier than you should do on the app. So it's not a one-to-one -one translation, but I've played it enough and I'm like, I, I quite like how the app works. Um, although I prefer playing it physically. So that's the main like woof of it. Um, I think the last thing to say is this is definitely the weakest of all of the Pathfinder campaigns that you can get because it's the most straightforward. Most of the time you are dealing with enemies that are just trying to kill you. It's, there's nothing like clever or unusual about the villains. And when you get to some of the other campaigns um, or to Apocrypha, you'll find there's very different things like um, the, the other expansion, like the big base stories are Skull and Shackles, which is about pirates. And you'll be on a boat. So it includes a load of ship mechanics and it has um, different like class routes. I didn't even talk about those. Um, then there's Wrath of the Righteous, which is based around demons and is punishingly hard to the point that there's actually official house rules on the Paseo website to allow you to tailor the early game experience for it to not utterly wreck you. Um, there's Mummy's Mask which I think is the best of the bunch. It's Egyptian themed. It's got some really cool things like there's a camel race and there's sandstorms and stuff. Um, and then most recently there's been the new core set. Has the same mechanics, has a different card style. I prefer the old card style. Some people are not keen on that because it's a lot of white space, but I think it looks really clean um, and clear, and I always know where I'm looking at everything. I find the new design on the core, new core set from 2019 to be a little much. It's a little busy, um, but you can mix cards back and forth between them, no problem, because they all use the same card back. And that's the other cool thing. If you love a character from Skull and Shackles, you can take them to any of the other campaigns and, and they, you know, you just need to trans, uh, transport over the character and their class card 
um, and their roll cards. Um, so that's the last bit I so mentioned briefly. Uh, eventually you reach a point where your character gets to choose an adventure path and you get this extra card and you can choose um, either side of it and you put it on and it alters how your character plays. So for example, Sioni, uh, once she gets there, she has the option to become a celestial sorcerer or an abyssal sorcerer. And this tags onto the bottom of your character sheet and replaces your original powers and may change your hand size and stuff. Um, and it gives you like this, uh, the specialist class kind of thing from Dungeons and Dragons, you know, where like you'll play a specific class, but then you get to play, say, I don't know, a swords bard in Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. So there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot in these games. Um, and I do think if you're interested, the best place to start is to try out the app because it's so cheap. And if you like what's going on there, then you could just go, all right, well, I'll play Rise of the Rune Lords electronically, and then maybe I'll look at one of the better ones, like Wrath of the Righteous, or uh, Mummy's Mask is my biggest recommendation, separately. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it is, it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of things to think about, and, um, like, combos and figuring out stuff, and it's got some very deep strategy to it, as you construct very honed engines that still feel like characters okay uh is there any any questions well i was going to ask how do you compare the the scenarios complexity or what you do into scenarios uh, uh with uh, to, to compare to for instance arkham or lcg based campaign but i think you already answered that yeah um arkham horror is definitely more complex um i'd say earthborn rangers is more complex as well because the main, the main, well, the main loop of this is there's X number of locations. Empty the locations of cards. Find the villain. Defeat the villain. And yeah, there can so be, it's... there can be variations where like suddenly the villain is not really a villain, and the henchmen are kind of like not henchmen anymore. They might be traps or um, curses that haunt you and stuff. But that's kind of, it's not super common in this base game. This base game, at least at the beginning in particular, keeps it very on the road you know very straight and simple classic almost dungeon crawling style except you're going round sandport at times and smashing things in yeah so so um this listed as a 2.75 weight um on <laughs> board game geek for the out of five for all the difference that means because um i'd say that just means it's kind of average uh let's have a quick look at what uh, Arkham Horror, the card game, is in comparison... It must be a 3 point something. Yeah, Arkham Horror is a 3.53. So hmm. it's way lighter than Arkham. Like, a 3.53 is pretty crunchy. Um, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's pretty light and accessible, but there is depth to what's going on. It's, yeah. definitely, it's definitely possible to do stuff wrong and be like, my character's garbage, and you have to work to fix <laughs> your deck. That, that, that can be done everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, the games always have possibility to play wrong. Okay, then. That's it. All right, sorry about that. I was struggling to put the cards back in. Um, I'm going <laughs> to just finish... I'm just going to finish with the physicality because I'm just reminded putting it back in that that does matter. Um, the, the version I have has a... It's a kind of a large box. Um, definitely a weird, like... it's. I think it's Calyx friendly from one direction only because it's rectangular. The insert that comes with the game is a waste of plastic. If you play the game without sleeving any of your cards, which you're welcome to do if that's how you feel. Um, I don't because like these are the kind of games I go back to and play again because playing different characters changes the mechanical feel. Um, the insert does it has like a set of six trays for each of the characters and it has some wells for the decks. But then each of the scenarios is meant to just stay inside the cardboard box you buy it in. And the cardboard box is stored inside the box as a whole. So if you want to sleeve the cards, you can't. And also, it, it gets really messy. Like my copy here of um, Rise of the Rune Lords is a second-hand copy. And when it, I got it, um, they'd sleeved everything, which was great. Uh, or they sleeved all the cards inside the main deck and not the ones in the side boxes. But it was such a mess and it took me nearly two hours to sort everything out. And even then I went, you know what, I'm going to get a wooden insert. Um, 
I hate throwing out the plastic. If I could use the plastic insert, I would have, but I threw it out. I got um, a laser ox insert now and everything is super organized and I've got lots of nice wooden dividers to break everything apart. It's made it a lot faster to set up and tear down. So that's a component criticism. Another one is, which I'm just reminded, the dice. You get one set of standard role-playing dice. So I got a D4, a D6, a D8, a D10, and a D12, right there. Got a nice little wooden holder with the laser ox thing. Usually, you don't just roll one D12, you might roll like two D12, or three D10, or four D4. So you don't get enough dice with this game for even playing one character. So this is the kind of thing if you do role playing anyway and everyone has their own dice sets, you just tell them, hey, we're playing this, bring your dice sets, you're gonna need them. You may have to borrow other people's dice. Otherwise you might have to buy some more dice. I think that's stingy. I think they should have given four of each dice. <laughs> I don't understand why they give one of each. If you try, when you've got to roll like 3d10 or even worse, like 3d8 or something, and you've got to add an extra number onto it, rolling them one at a time can result in like, what did I, what did I roll? Uh, you know, <laughs> that, that moments of just, or for people who, you know, can't do that, like, it, it, you know, adding and then you generate a new number and you add it, you generate a new number and you add it. Some people will have difficulty with that. And that's why you're meant to roll like three dice at once. So you can add up the numbers visually right there and then, or somebody else can go, oh, that's what this is. Um, yeah, it's just a bit of an accessibility and one of those things where I feel like it's kind of an own goal. Every single, every single one of them is like this. You get that same bad insert, you get that same one set of dice. Even the latest version, which has a smaller box and a nicer insert that's like cardboard, so I didn't throw it out and it takes up less space on the shelf, it still only has one of each dice. Um, kind of reminds me of, of how, how, you know, usually it starts with role-playing game, like, oh yeah, I buy a set of dice and then you notice, hmm, I need more, so I buy a second or first set and then you play a wizard and you throw a fireball and need 10d6 and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and suddenly I mean, you have a big collection of dice. Yeah, of course. Uh, in our day and age now, lucky us, we can um, we can just use apps to do dice generation for us. Um, what? Yes, I know. Incredible. Like, who heard of it? <laughs> but but I'm sorry. No, wait, wait, wait. You you, you don't roll with an app, do you? Um, no, I don't personally. But I've got a Good. bowl okay. of Good. dice from. Uh, I've got. So many D10s that I don't know what to do with them because of... Yeah, certainty. asking for a friend, yes. Yeah, yeah. The only yeah. case where it's fine to roll with an app is when you play a new role-playing game that uses special dice, like if you try out the fate system and you notice, oh, I don't have dice with plus and minus on them. Um, uh, yeah, I, for this first game, you may try an app. I dis you're gatekeeping there, Kara. I think if somebody <laughs> wants to use an app for their dice rolling and they like put the phone down and they tap the roll right there and everyone can see what the result is, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, if people want to, you know, like Oathsworn show that you can just have a deck of cards instead of dice if you want. So I think that's fine. But uh, as a product just giving one set of dice each and that is not enough for even the base game first scenario that is like why did you bother putting dice in at all why didn't you just say and you'll need some your role-playing dice or something <laughs> so that's my criticisms is garbage insert um the box size is a bit unwieldy and weird and um dice are terrible and also that this one is definitely your beginner one so that is Pathfinder, the uh, uh, Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Rise of the Rune Lords. I'll circle back in the future to talk about probably one or two of the other campaigns, but I won't have to do the, the mechanics as heavily. And eventually we'll get to the whole reason for this big journey, which is Apocrypha the World, which I recommend over Pathfinder. I like the mechanics more, I like the setting more, and the fact is you only buy three boxes and you've got everything, and that's a hundred scenarios for, like, just under $150. Like, yeah, but... Go on. No, you go. <laughs> no, I, I mean, at the end of this journey, probably people will we, we know why it's recommended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why I... But it's actually a personal preference, because I like um, urban fantasy, I like urban horror that Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, um, Dresden Files kind of thing. Uh, but this even goes into, like, techno horror. Like, it has te techno golems. 
as one of the enemy factions. But I will talk about that in the future. Um, I, I just say, like, if you if you like, I don't want a generic fantasy one. Apocrypha is still available. Um, it can be ordered, and you can get everything for a very reasonable price. Even though I bought this second hand, it still cost more than I would have liked. And then I bought the app version as well, so I could play it more rapidly. Um, and have two games going at once. Uh, yeah, so th this is a lifestyle game, shall we say. You could definitely sink a couple of thousand euros into Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. There are so many, like, class add-on boxes. You can play as goblins in a particular campaign. drive Through Cards has a whole um, section of print-and-play cards, um, which is nice that they're supporting the game. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, at the moment, the future of the game is a bit... We don't know if there's any new content coming out. Um, I think 2019 or 2020 was the last time we saw something. And I don't know if we're going to see new stuff um, again in the future. Uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because this is a complete story and campaign and beat from a humble beginnings all the way to the end in one big box. So, um... I guess now we should uh, climb on board with Admiral Alessio because we're going for a sail. <laughs> doot, doot. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a steam. That's a steamship. Yeah. What are you doing? Uh, 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 where we are, wind. I, I, yeah, I mean, it's in the name, sail. I mean. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just want to go doot, doot whenever boats are involved. Yeah, in just, 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 just. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so let's have a nice, relaxing sail around the ocean with Admiral Alessio. Okay, that's much better. So sail, uh, sail. It's a trick-taking game for two players. It's a trick-taking co-op. It's a game out this year from uh, four games worth crowdfunding project by Allplay. Allplay is the new name of BoardGameTables.com. Uh, they are known for their um, swingy kickstarters, like they do good stuff and they have problems delivering and so on. We are not here talking about this. So basically, Sale is a reimplementation of uh, Amel Cave, which is uh, in turn a 2021 game by Akiyama Koryo and Korzu Yusei, and uh, uh, it's basically a reskin of the same game, it's basically identical, and here it's why you should consider it. Uh, it's a trick-taking game, and you are two players uh, uh, cooperating to bring your... Uh, a ship to safe waters. You have one ship tile, one board divided in lozenges uh, instead of squares, and uh, you have a start point and three end point you should reach before the end of the turns. There is uh, a sea of uncharted perils with islands you cannot cross over, with the kraken which will damage your ship, and uh, with uh, uh, approaching storms, usually you get two in uh, your games, that you must uh, surpass, go over, uh, before a set turn, turn three and turn, uh, end, on, uh, end of turn two, and then on turn four, actually. And that's basically it. How do you play sail? Uh, it's very simple, you get basically, it's trick taking, you have three suits of cards, uh, they are numbered uh, 1 to 9, and uh, uh, there are just three suits for the entire deck, you get the card numbered 1 and 2 at the beginning, and you use them to make the Kraken deck, which is the deck the Kraken uses to make damage. With the other cards, you shuffle them and you give, you deal nine of them to each player. There are two players, one in front of each other. Uh, and you begin to play suits. Each card has one or two symbols, and when you uh, complete the trick, the, the, the complete trick, you will end up with a combination of symbols on the cards. At that point, you go to resolve the symbols. You basically can, for instance, have two wheels to move the 
the ship one square in the direct one losange in the direction of the player who won the trick. You can use two cannons to do a random cannon action uh, picking from the leftover of the deck. You can uh, do a wheel plus kraken and another wheel to damage the kraken so to add cards to the kraken deck because uh, basically when the kraken damages you you get to um, you you get to take the low number cards from the kraken deck and you add them to your discard pile so that in next end they will be shuffled in and they will basically dilute your actions when you end the kraken deck also and there's only the kraken card which is the which marks the end of the deck uh, you actually lose so that's a reason to basically damage the kraken from time to time that's basically it when uh, you play tricks one after the other and resolve the actions when uh, one of the two players has won four tricks you go to the end of the turn the kraken damage damages the ship once and then you reshuffle and you deal new cards and go on again you win if you get to the end tile you lose if uh, the kraken has damaged you enough so that the kraken card is the only one remaining in the kraken deck or you uh, don't get in time past the storm so if it's the start of turn three and you are not past the first storm uh, you have lost and it's the same at the start of turn 5 or if your turn marker ends so if you go past turn 5 after turn 5 you lose and uh, in the end if the Kraken has damaged you enough times so he, you could uh, have cards left over in the Kraken deck but the Kraken counter which goes up one level whenever it managed to damage you uh, goes to the end of the track which is four spaces if I remember it correctly anyway this is basically it the game is exceptionally simple it's a trick taking game and it plays very fast uh, 15 to 20 minutes there are a few things which are really smart and are recommended and are why I recommended this. The first one is uh, the fact that uh, uh, you are free to talk uh, about what you are about to do until cards are dealt and uh, from that point onward you cannot talk again until the end of the turn. So uh, this means basically that uh, the games is more smart than you would you would think because usually uh, what happens uh, that as long as the kraken gets to damage you you get your deck padded with low level cards low level cards mean that uh, uh, whoever gets those card dealt uh, has problems winning the trick and this means that you get less actions because uh, if you get dealt a lot of one and twos you won't get a trick uh, one so is just the other player who gets to, to win all tricks and that way the turns end faster because whenever one player gets to four tricks taken uh, the turn ends so that means that uh, you have actually to look out for a lot of stuff with a very smart and elegant mechanic because by using the same deck uh, whenever you place your cards uh, they mean something different. You are doing crowd control, for instance. You are moving your ship. You are doing stuff. There is another thing which is uh, very smart and it's the fact that the game gets trickier the more you play, the, the long the, games, the game draws on. Because, basically, uh, no matter how much damage you control, uh, you will end up with some padding, with some added cards in your deck and with less cards in the Kraken deck which will get nastier and nastier as long as the game progresses so you can feel the urgency of playing the third thing is that there are actually this is the real uh, 
improvement over the original ML cave, uh, you get uh, scenarios where the, the, the start and end goal are moved across the board, which means that uh, it's not always the same distance uh, uh, like in the original game, but you have to travel varying amount of distances with impassable terrain thrown in, which means sometimes you have to, to force another player to win uh, because you have to move in the direction of that player. You are Remember that you are moving on Los Angeles, so that means that you usually cannot move in a straight line unless you unlock a specific power. Uh, so you are always zigzagging through the map and uh, that means that you have to careful, carefully consider what you're doing because uh, in that specific turn that player has to win the trick and then you have for instance you need to make another move otherwise you will be in big trouble next turn so you have to consider a very careful action economy so uh, this game goes goes with six scenarios, one of which is learning scenario really, really simple. And uh, these scenarios have a varying amount of difficulty and pose uh, various amounts of challenges. Uh, all of this is in a game which is basically the, in a box the size of two oink games, one uh, to the side of, it, of another. So we are talking of a very small box for a game with a board. And uh, basically, that's all there's to say about this game. I like it. There is uh, There are actually a couple of downsides I wanted to mention. Uh, you, your, each player can choose a pirate uh, that represents them and they give them uh, a special power. These special powers are key to the victory, but the problem is that the really you have to pick two, and if you can pick, there is a combination of two powers which is way more powerful for than uh, than any any other. So basically, this kind of variable powers will probably be better if it was uh, uh, randomly selected but uh, probably take uh, take two, pick one, or something like that. Uh, the real variance in that is that you should uh, choose at the same time, so there is a bit of randomness, but in the end, uh, expert players will always pick the same choices. The other thing is that scenario progression is actually not really consistent. You'd expect, for instance, that scenario 4 is uh, harder than scenario 3, but I found quite the opposite. Actually, we have yet to solve uh, scenario 3, uh, but this is possibly, since we are talking about trick-taking, and a lot of people have their own way of playing trick-taking, and when you are in a group, for instance, you, you learn this when you play games like The Crew, for instance, uh, you will get in an economy which is specific to your group of players. So that could be that the inconsistency in difficulty is actually an inconsistency in playing we are having. But that's it. It's a very simple game. You can get a deluxified edition with wooden meeples uh, and it's beautiful to see when it's on board. And you can also get a small Seafire expansion, which is a lot of value for what you pay, because I think it's less than $10, but you get to have new powers, new pirates, and you get uh, six new sh scenarios with uh, other three landmarks, which give you different powers and shake things up a little bit more. Uh, this is Sail, it's a very simple game, and uh, I have to confess here that I have uh, an admiration of how Japanese designs get made like this. I, I I love this kind of simplicity in explaining and playing a game. They are very fast, they are replayable, they are beautiful. They are really like an haiku, and uh, that's basically it. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, so um, is the expansion like completely new? Because I was just looking at Hamlin Cave, and um, 
I really like the aesthetic of Hamlin Cave, so do you know what the differences are between the two? Is it like just a straight translation across, or...? Uh, okay, about the aesthetics, uh, it's completely different, I'm afraid, because... Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, I, meant, I meant, like, like is, is it mechanically, are they identical? Um, is the yeah. expansion translated from Hamlin Cave across, or is that new? Okay, Sail is a comp- is basically a one-to-one translation of Hamlin Cave with the addition of a variable positioning of start and end points. For the rest, it's basically the same. The expansion adds more stuff, which leverages this. Uh, we, I, I actually don't know if MLK got an expansion because I follow Japanese games, but unfortunately, I am crap at yep. reading anything uh, Japanese. I'm, so. I'm not <laughs> seeing any expansion for Hamlin Cave, so I wasn't sure if like um, Hamlin Cave had it built in or not. If we don't know, we don't know. No, it the, doesn't. the fact that you've said there are variable setups for sale means like it's not just a straight translation across. It is a um, an upgrade. Obviously, it. Because it can do what the original one does, but it can do more. So yeah, that's... yeah, it, it looks and, like an upgrade. Yes, right. And then my other question is, if you were going to pick sail or um, let's say the crew two, because that's water orientated, um, and you're that's it. That's your two player trick get taking game for on a desert island. Which one would you pick? Oh well. At the moment, it depends by the number of players because the it's, two, it's, two, I just it's, I said yeah. I said two player trick ah, okay. taking. Yeah. Would you okay. take? You're, you're stranded on a desert island with your significant other. Don't worry, all your kids are fine. Um, they're in an orphanage now. We don't worry about them. Um, but you can. You have one trick taking game for two players. It's either sail or it's the crew deep sea. Isn't it called deep sea? Uh, yeah, which, mission which, deep sea. Mission deep sea. Which one would you you prefer? I would bring mission deep sea if I have to choose just for one thing, I think objective 10, the one uh, the one where you have to declare the cards before was a lot of fun for the whole family. I know that for two players probably uh, sale is funnier, but the number of objectives you get in the crew is probably compensating for that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of lot of different styles of play in the crew. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's 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 cool. That was. It's not going to affect my judgment at all. It was just a question I thought was interesting. Uh, so yeah. 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 Actually, uh, I I mean this. I I don't think of myself as a trick taking game player. But if I look backward, I have a heck of a lot of trick taking games I appreciate. So uh, when I stumble upon a game like Sale, which is basically a twenty-dollar game, you you can bring everywhere because it's very small. It has a small footprint. It's all wooden cardboard. Uh, I have to suggest to recommend it because uh, it's a full seven to me. So if you don't want to play that crew, you don't want to stay there replaying that scenario obsessively, uh, since we are talking about the crew. Uh, and you are just the two of you playing, uh, just consider sail. It's a breath of fresh air and it's a fun way of trick taking game. Of play trick taking. And that's it. Okay, uh, Kari, you don't have any questions, do you? No? Okay, that's absolutely fine. So uh, that was. Um... I managed to fail the brief and not provide the... Uh, if I'd have done um, uh, uh, Sails and Shackles um, for uh, for Pathfinder, we could have had a completely nautical-themed selection involving messing around on boats. Um, but, yeah, so... Uh, it, 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 let's call it. It was. It's basically nautically themed. I mentioned um, sail and shackles. Uh, you know. So uh, yeah. Uh, that is. Um, you know. That change of tack means this is all we have time for in this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last andy, and you can subscribe and follow us on YouTube or whatever um, podcast app that you uh, like. I think we're on most of them. Uh, so until the next time, we have been the last standy. So it's goodbye from Alessio. Bye. Cara. Bye. And myself. And remember, even if I said it before, the second E in Standee is for Eos. <laughs>